how do you make someone tell the truth when they are unwilling to give it? One of the great challenges of living in our society is detecting when someone is telling the truth or not. When we want to extract the truth from someone withholding information, we often result to violence and punishment. But isn't there another, more effective, less damaging way? Yes. You have probably seen it before on your screen. The magical injection that makes anyone speak the truth, even if they don't want to. The first person to realize and document that certain chemicals, besides alcohol, affect the brain in a specific way that elicits the true answers was the Roman Pliny the Elder. He took notice of the fact that extremely intoxicated people loosened up their lips and spoke out mainly the truth without thinking much about it. This was one of the earliest and most ancient forms of lie detection, and tended to be a whole lot more effective than putting someone in a small, dark, musty cell for days. Not only alcohol was used, but also the toxic plant Nightshade, containing the compound scopolamine. In 1922, the doctor Robert House noted that women giving scopolamine with morphine during childbirth answered questions accurately and truthfully. He later went on to inject prisoners with scopolamine in 1926, hoping to get confessions. Just a few years later, the uprising of a class of sedative hypnotic drugs called barbiturates brought forth a new game-changing method of truth extraction. The company buyer did not wait long by putting the barbiturate barbitone out on the market, quickly after it was discovered. It saw great success, and is in fact still used today in some countries. Other pharmaceutical companies saw this success, and quickly started designing new patentable derivatives. This boom in popularity led to the design of 1500 barbiturate derivatives, and in 1930 a very prominent one was found, sodium thiopental, which is almost analogous to what I will be synthesizing today. Most barbiturates up until this point produced mild daytime sedation, calmed the nerves, gently induced relaxing sleep, and worked for about 4 to 12 hours. When thiopental was first used, in 1934, the researchers discovered it was able to produce extremely short-lasting total anesthesia in patients. On top of that, in milder doses, it produced strong sedation with euphoriant effects, which only lasted about 20 minutes. This extremely short duration, combined with the ultra-relaxing state, got it proposed as a possible truth serum turning patients in a cognitively impaired and ultra-relaxed happy state, making them unable to grasp the consequences of their actions, like telling the truth. To no surprise, sodium thiopental was, and likely still is used today by the CIA and many other countries' organizations, to force criminals such as terrorists to tell the truth. So unsurprisingly, sodium thiopental is illegal to synthesize where I live, and probably where you live too. But what I can do, is make the almost near equal sodium thiamylol, which is completely legal here. Thiamylol is almost one to one to thiopental in effect, with it actually being a little more potent. The synthesis and structure are almost identical, so it can likely make a good through serum as well. When looking at the structure of barbiturates, we see that they are all derivatives of the heterocyclobarbituric acid, differing only in their specific side chains, which is also why they work differently. Barbiturates work by affecting the brain. Considering that the brain is fatty tissue, when we change the side chain to be more nonpolar and so lipophilic, we can potentially increase absorption and potency of the molecule. The same goes for changing the ketone to a thioketone, making it a little bit more lipophilic. But we can't change too much of this part of the molecule before it becomes a problem. Sodium thiamylol is the thioketone derivative of the notorious sodium secobarbital, which was sold under the brand name Seconal. Bright red colored capsules, also known as red devils, which got many people addicted back in the day. When we compare sodium thiopental and sodium thiamylol, we see that thiamylol only has an extra carbon with a double bond, making them very similar in their effects. Barbiturates are also used as their sodium salt. This is done to make them more water soluble and thus getting absorbed easier, since their free acid form is not so soluble. Now that we know a little bit more about barbiturates, what do barbiturates even do in the brain? They are known to strengthen the effects of the dampening neurotransmitter GABA. GABA plays an incredibly important role in the central nervous system, inhibiting or dampening exciting chemical signals, so that there is no sensory overload. Barbiturates bind on the barbiturate side of the GABA-A receptor. This action increases the duration of ion channel opening, so the inhibitory effects of GABA are stronger, since there is more time for action potentials. At high doses, Thiamylol can open the whole GABA receptor without any GABA binding, basically making your body go Windows blue screen, because now there's an extreme amount of dampening. If we want to extract the truth, we don't make someone go blue screen, just enough to remove any mental blockades against telling the truth. Now that we know how it works, let's take a quick look at the synthesis of thiamylol, which can be adapted easily to make almost any barbiturate. 
The synthesis takes three steps, starting from the common reagent, diethylmalonate, of which the first and second step are basically the same, and the third one is also very similar. To make thiamylol specifically, I do need the reagent 2-bromopentane, which is surprisingly not commercially available. So let's start simple and make that first, starting with 2-pentanol. So to get started, I set up a large flask with a stir bar and use the whole bottle of 2-pentanol that I bought, which is 100 ml. It is just a clear liquid, and it smells very similar to isopropanol. I then mix that with 300 ml of my slightly yellow 48% hydrobromic acid. I heat it to a reflux and attach a condenser, and then leave it like this overnight. In this simple reaction, the alcohol of 2-pentanol is replaced by a bromine. How it works is that the strong acid protonates the alcohol, which forms a great leaving group. The bromide ion can then quickly attack the carbon and kick off water, giving the product 2-bromopentane and water. When I come back the next day, it looks almost the same, and the reaction should be finished. Now that the alcohol is removed, the product isn't so polar anymore and doesn't dissolve in the acid, so it forms two layers and I can separate the product from the acid with the separatory funnel. I then take the 2-bromopentane layer and add some anhydrous sodium sulfate to absorb remaining droplets of the acid. I then just decant this directly into a flask and set it up for short path vacuum distillation to distill over the 2-bromopentane. When that's done, a tiny bit of yellow liquid remains behind, and I am left with 115 grams of 2-bromopentane as a clear liquid, which is a yield of 82%, and that is pretty close to the literature, and totally fine, since I am making more than I need anyway. Now that I have all the reagents required to make the barbiturate, I will start the barbiturate synthesis. So for the first reaction, I set up a large flask with a serbar and add in 500 ml of dimethyl formamide as a solvent. Then as a first reactant, I add in 30.6 ml of diethylmalonate. I set this mixture in an ice bath and let it cool down, to dampen the exothermic reaction with the base, which is potassium terbutoxide, and of that, I add 22.8 grams. I add it gradually, spread over 10 minutes, so that it doesn't produce too much heat. When all of it has dissolved, we see it has become slightly yellow, probably from the formed intermediate, and at this point, I can add the next reactant, which is 16.6 ml of alloyl chloride, and that can all be added at once, since the reaction isn't that fast. I then take it out of the ice bath and let it stir at room temperature overnight. In this reaction, diethylmalonate can react with alloyl chloride in the presence of a strong base, giving the monoallylated product and also a little bit of the diallylated product. How it works is that the central carbon of diethylmalonate has two protons that are relatively acidic which can be deprotonated by a strong enough base such as potassium terbutoxide, resulting in this enolate, which can be described by two resonance structures. The enolate can attack the electron-deficient carbon of the alloyl chloride, adjacent to the chlorine, causing the chlorine to be kicked off, giving the monoallylated product and potassium chloride. In a few percent of cases, this product can undergo the exact same reaction again, with the second acidic proton, giving an unwanted diallylated product. The reaction can also be done with alloyl bromide, which is more efficient, but I just have too much alloyl chloride standing. When I return, it has become cloudy and a lot more yellow. I again set the flask in an ice bath and then quench the reaction by destroying all the base and remaining enolate with dilute hydrochloric acid. The yellow color disappears and the mixture becomes white. I then add in 350 ml of the solvent ethyl acetate to dissolve the product and a bunch of water to dissolve salts and hold on to most of the DMF. The flask is too small for this volume, so I move it all to a 2 liter Erlenmeyer flask. I keep adding water until it becomes transparent, and then add even more water and ethyl acetate to get proper separation of the two phases. If there's too little water, the ethyl acetate will just mix with the DMF and water. When there is visible separation of the layers, I separate them, but this time a large dropping funnel will have to suffice, since all my separatory funnels broke and my new ones are coming later. I have taken the ethyl acetate layer into the large Erlenmeyer and dried it with sodium sulfate like before. This time, I filter it through some cotton into a flask so no particles come through. I set it up for vacuum distillation to remove all of the ethyl acetate, and when that's done, a yellowish liquid is left behind that contains the product. Since there's some residual DMF in there, I can't properly calculate the yield. I also won't separate the mono and diallylated product, since the scale I am doing makes it difficult and costly. Since it's only a few percent, it doesn't really matter for this demonstration, and I can just forward the product as is. The following reaction is mostly the same, but I will use different reagents for convenience, since for the first one, I was just following the literature. This exact same procedure 
could also be used for the previous reaction. So for this, I add 200 ml of ethanol as a solvent and react it to a large flask and react it with 4.48 grams of sodium metal. I heat the mixture and let it reflux until all the sodium disappears. In this reaction, the sodium reacts with ethanol to form sodium ethoxide, which is a strong base, and hydrogen, which floats away. When it's done, I set the flask in an ice bath to cool it down and then add all of the previous product. As the second reactant, I add in 30.5 grams of the 2-bromopentane I made earlier. Just like before, I take it out of the ice bath and let it stir overnight at room temperature. This reaction is the same as the previous, but instead, I am using a different base and solvent. In the end, resulting in the desire to dye substituted product with an allo group and a 1-methylbutyl group. When I return, it looks a little bit more green and hazy. I again quench the reaction with dilute hydrochloric acid, and some less soluble salts precipitate from the mixture. I set it up for filtration to remove the precipitated salts. And I then distill off all of the ethanol from the filtrate. When that's done, a yellow liquid and some water with salts are left behind. So I partition it between more water and ethyl acetate to get rid of the salts and extract out the product. I separate the layers in the separatory funnel and extract the water phase once more with ethyl acetate. I then dry it again with sodium sulfate, filter it, and distill off all of the solvent. In the end, I am left with 32 grams of what is mostly the product diethyl 1-methylbutyl allyl melanate, giving an overall yield of about 58%, including impurities. And I can just use it like this for the next reaction. So the final reaction is quite similar, but not fully. And you guessed it, I again need a strong base, for which I again react sodium with ethanol. When it is prepared, I pour all the dye substituted product into the solution. And as the final reagent, I add in 9.9 grams of thiourea. For a change, I heat this mixture to a reflux and leave it overnight. In this reaction, the dye substituted malinate reacts with thiourea in the presence of a strong base to give the sodium salt of the barbiturate thiamylol. The first thing that happens is deprotonation of thiourea by sodium ethoxide. This deprotonated form is a good nucleophile and can attack one of the esters of the malinate, forcing a pair of carbonyl double bond electrons onto the oxygen. When this electron pair returns to form a double bond, it instead kicks off the ethoxide part to give back sodium ethoxide and this intermediate. The now attached thiourea can undergo deprotonation by sodium ethoxide again, but on the other side. This will then attack the other ester intermolecularly, giving a cyclized intermediate. Then the same as before happens, and it kicks off the ethoxide. Finally, Sodium ethoxide can deprotonate the form barbiturate, which is a bit acidic, giving the corresponding sodium salt of the product thiamylol. When I return the next day, it has become a bit orange, and I immediately distill off all of the ethanol. A pinkish yellow solid is then left behind, containing mostly the sodium salt of the barbiturate, remaining base, excess thiourea, thiourea, and impurities. So to destroy all the sodium ethoxide and dissolve the product, I add some water. It is then an orange solution, from which I can separate out the barbiturate by adding hydrochloric acid, which converts it into its poorly soluble free acid form. The mixture turns yellow, but nothing crystallizes out yet, because a lot of barbiturates are actually very difficult to crystallize out, especially if they contain sulfur. So, I set it in the freezer to force it out. It is then a yellow slushy, which I set up for filtration, leaving the barbiturate on the filter, which I wash once with some dilute hydrochloric acid. I scrape it all off and transfer the wet solid to this crystallizing dish. I will try to purify it more by recrystallization with ethanol. In the end, I transferred all of the solution to this flask, but I used way more ethanol than I needed, because I thought it wasn't dissolving, but actually the cloudiness of the solution is normal for barbiturates. Also, they gradually degrade in solution. I tried to precipitate it all by adding water, but there was way too much ethanol. So I ended up just distilling most of the liquid off, and after letting it sit in the fridge, it settled in an ugly manner to the bottom. So I just decant off all of the liquid, and then dissolve it into a sodium hydroxide solution, giving the sodium salt of thiamylol in solution, which is also how they would be used in an injection. For a real injection, this would of course be made sterile, in a proper concentration, with saline, and buffered so that it doesn't kill you. But here, we don't care about the patient, and we only want to extract the truth. So it sucks that you are my patient today. 
I might even try it my, myself. Nor is this Veritas Serum. Three drops of this, and you know who himself would spill his darkest secrets. My patient, confess. Or else, I will make you confess. What? You aren't subscribed to Cameolis? <sighs> Sleepy time for you then.